Uh, hi, everybody. Also, thanks for coming after lunch and after the first session after lunch. Uh, quick. I'm Simon Wisto. I'm one of the co-founders of Fastly and also the VP of product strategy. Um, I spend most of my life in airports um, and so uh, and with terminal jet lag. But the um, so just a quick uh, view around here. Apart from the obvious two gentlemen in the in the Fastly t-shirts over there, uh, how many people here have heard of Fastly? Okay, that makes me feel so much better. How many people are customers? Okay, that's good. That's that's good. Um, so what is Fastly? So uh, we're at CDM. We started in 2011, which is after the great big boom of CDNs got started in like the 2005, 2006. Um, sort of glut of new CDNs. Um, and the reason why we started was because we were frustrated with the state of CDNs at the time. The whole market was moribund. Uh, it was basically reselling bandwidth. And you know when you wanted to make config changes, it took minutes or in some cases even hours. Um, when you wanted to change config, like the best you could do if you paid a lot of money was like 15 minutes, maybe eight minutes, but generally it took a long time. When you wanted to get your logs, it could take up to 24 hours to get your logs. And that just wasn't the way that we were building websites. Um, we were doing, like at places I've worked, we were doing deploys 20, 30 times a day. This was the, day, the, the age of DevOps. So what we wanted to do was build a CDN that fitted in much more with what we wanted to do. We wanted it to be uh, real time. We wanted it to be API driven so it could fit in with our um, infrastructure. Uh, and we wanted it to be com like easily configurable and very, very powerful. Um, and so we, because there wasn't one, we set out and started to build one. Uh, since 2011, we've um, grown a lot. It's kind of surprising for me. For started off with three of us on a couch, and it's now, I think this slide is actually out of date because there's now like over 325 employees. We seem to be onboarding. Like more and more people every week, um, and we built up to a 10 terabit per second network. I think that's also out of date now. I think that's that's gone up as well. So it's kind of terrifying growth. And the kind of customers we've seen has been pretty impressive. Uh, when we started off, we had a lot of uh, sort of very high tech, small sort of like startups, very San Francisco based, a lot of SaaS companies. Um, but it's grown a lot since then. Uh, we have a really strong uh, presence in the digital media and publishing companies, like names like Wena Media, who you might not have heard of, but they, they do things like Rolling Stone. They're very, very big. Condé Nast, um, Business Insider, The Guardian newspaper in the UK. Uh, we have a lot of e-commerce. Uh, e-commerce, when you look at it, is very much like digital publishing. So we have people like Boots who are kind of, if you're British, you know who Boots are. Uh, if you are not British, then they're kind of like Walgreens. In fact, they're owned by Walgreens. Uh, we have people like First Dibs, Shopify, Kayak. Um, and then we also grew into sort of audio and video and streaming. So we have customers like A&E, Vimeo, iHeartMedia. Um, and what's been interesting is, as we've grown into different industries, we've started to learn a lot more about what people want to do on top of our platform. Um, and so if you're interested, there's a bunch more customers that we can, we can talk about, like only under NDA. There's a couple of customers we have who won't let us talk about, um, talk about them because they see us as a competitive advantage, which is very flattering to our egos, but is but drives our marketing team absolutely nuts. But uh, we can talk about them under NDA. So if any of you want to come and talk afterwards, we can talk about them. So I'm here to talk about the edge cloud. Uh, and the edge cloud is one of those terms which um, it, it sounds like an overly marketing term. It sounds like very vague. But some of the stuff we've had to do, we've had to do because we're trying to change the way the conversation is, is kind of presented. Um, at the moment, we have, we've, we've seen the, the, the way that you build websites change from like the mid-90s when it was like everything was server-side. We started to get around 2000, 90, late 1999, uh, 2000, we started getting DHTML, sort of rise of JavaScript. And then we started getting into much more sophisticated apps. So we had Outlook Web Access, which was the kind of first use of, of Ajax. What was then, we would later become Ajax. We started getting Gmail, started getting Google Maps. And suddenly we started getting stuff that was much more sophisticated. And we saw this blending between the server side and the client side. And the problem with the server side is that um, it's, it's in inflexible. When if you've got your own data centers, you need to have a bunch of capacity which might be going to waste because you need to deal with spikes. Um, but also, it's a long way away from your customers. 
Um, and then we had, uh, then you've got the client side, and the client side is great because it's right by your customers, but it's, it's not a trustworthy environment. Uh, I, mean, I mean that in a computer science term, I don't mean that browsers are literally untrustworthy, but you can't really trust the environment that like, can be interfered with. But then we saw this next phase, we saw the rise of the cloud. And you know, we saw it at AWS, and then Google Cloud, and Microsoft, Azure. Um, and the cloud kind of offered a lot of the, um, the sort of the scalability, this elasticity, um, which was great. Um, and it mean you didn't have to have these big data centers. You didn't have to have machines lying around um, sort of unused because you were waiting to, to be hit by uh, traffic spikes or anything. But the big problem with the, the, the cloud, this, this central cloud, is that it's built around the model of big data centers. Uh, and these, there's few, they're kind of few and far between. You know, you've got US East and US West. You've got a couple in Europe and stuff like that. And they're still quite a long way away from the users. So in the same way that it made sense to use to move a bunch of the logic from your origin servers out to the, to the client, it also makes sense to move a bunch of your logic out further out towards the edge. And so this is where we come in. Um, we allow customers to move stuff from their origin servers and move the logic much closer to the browser while still being in a trustworthy computing environment. So what our customers like, they can do is they can do everything from load balancing. They can do geographic load balancing. A customer comes in, it comes into one of our, into our San Jose pub. We can automatically route them to uh, US West rather than US East. You know, if you were trying to do that geographic load balancing back at your origin, the customer would have to travel all the way back to your primary data center, which might be thousands of miles away from them, to get the logic to say, oh, actually, you were better off on the West Coast to start off with. Um, we can do, so you can do secure to the edge. When you move stuff like um, sort of WAF or TLS termination to the edge, it means that everything is happening much closer to the user, and you don't have to have that capacity back at your origin. Um, there's uh, app delivery. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can move the logic to the edge, things like token authentication, uh, things like A-B testing, things like little bits of logic which you can handle at the edge, which means that you don't, you don't have to have this logic back at your origin server. It means you can cache more, and it means your site is a lot faster, and it loads a lot quicker. And there is so much um, information out there about the effect that uh, latency and page load speed has on your bottom line your bounce rates, your advertising rates, your conversion rates. So what, is, what do we think of as being the, um, the advantages of an edge cloud and what, what the qualities of an edge cloud are? So one of the things that's really important to us is if you're going to move logic to the edge, you need stuff to run instantly. If you're going to make a content invalidation, it can't run in 15 minutes, 2 hours, 24 hours. You need to invalidate that content instantly. Because otherwise, you can't put things like breaking news on your edge servers. Um, in the same time, you, can ha you have to have stuff that is real time. You need insights into what is going on. If you are a content publisher and one of your articles is blowing up and going viral, it's useless to you if you only find out about it the day afterwards. So you need this ability to see what is going on. You need to, uh, you need to be able to see like, the stats and the logs that are going on at the same, at the same time that they're happening. You need to see them in real time. And it needs to be programmable, because you need to have a proper development environment at the edge. You need to be able to do, you can't just have click and widgets and stuff that just with a limited availability. You need to build, build business logic at the edge. So you need to have a properly programmable environment. And to do that, you need to have this instant, uh, instant config changes, instant invalidation, and you need to have this real-time insights, because you're not going to move your code to the edge if like, you can only make changes once every eight hours, and you can't see what's going on when you've made the changes. So you also need to be agile. This is the age of DevOps. This is, you know, no, we're not going back to the days of doing deploys once a month, or once every six months. People do, like, uh, teams do, um, do deploys 20, 30 times a day now. And it can't be that your, your CDN cannot be the slowest part of your infrastructure. It can't be the least visible. It can't just be a black box that you throw content into and, and just hope that it works. You need to have some way of doing development and uh, making changes as fast as you can make changes to your core app and, and see what's going on. And you need rapid enforcement. Like, the internet comes at you fast, like, to, to misquote kind of Ferris Bueller. Like, we've seen in the last couple of days that uh, things are crazy. You can't have stuff that takes a long time to deploy while you're getting attacked. You need to have rapid enforcement. You need to be able to deploy new WAF rules, new DDoS rules. You need to see what's going on. 
you need to put in new blocks and new ACLs and new behavior based on what is happening to your system as fast as possible because every moment that you can't do that, every moment you're waiting, you're losing money and you're impacting your performance. So this is kind of an overall diagram of everything that's going on. It's kind of a typical kind of blue box diagram that's just kind of sliced and diced. But basically what, uh, what we have, we build a platform that people can build on top of. And so on top of those customer developed applications, we have all the stuff that we've built into the platform. And not only we've got this API that uh, allows you to do whatever you want with our platform. And on top of that, sort of spanning all of these, our customers have built these apps that sort of we can give out to other customers. So partners and customers can, uh, can build this kind of impromptu marketplace. So a lot of stuff that we do is built with partners. Um, so for example, Perimeter X, uh, they are a fantastic bot detection uh, company. And so we built them into our platform. And so it built it in multiple places. Like we can serve their JavaScript. Um, but then also when the uh, request comes back to us, we can send it off to their um, processing libraries and then get a response back and say, yes, this is a bot. This is not a bot. Um, the sort of like flow diagram I could walk through, but it's kind of short, uh, short, uh, short presentation, so I won't go into too much detail. But um, we were able to build their functionality deeply inside our CDN uh, just using our Edge SDK. Similarly, with Google Cloud Platform, we have a very strong relationship with Google Cloud. Uh, so we do everything from having private networking connects with, uh, with them to uh, being able to read stuff off Google uh, Cloud Storage to being able to push logs and stats directly into Google Cloud Platform, into BigQuery, into Google Cloud Storage, into Google PubSub. Um, and 100%, we can send 100% of your logs in real time into Google Cloud Platform, which is huge. So people can get real-time insights, real-time data mining into what's going on with their system. Um, and we also have a whole bunch of other logging and analytics partners. Uh, people like Sumo Logic, Log Entries, a whole bunch more. Uh, we're adding more all the time. It's relatively easy for us to add them. So when customers come to us, we strive to fit in with what a customer's infrastructure already is. We don't force them to fit in with our system. We try and fit in with them. We want to be a partner to our customers, and we want to fit in with the infrastructure they have already. Um, but also our API allows our partners to build, pull stuff from us. So Datadog's integration into Fastly, we didn't have to do anything for. They just pull it directly from our historical stats API and our real-time stats API. But the other cool thing, and this is, this is one of the things that really blew me away, uh, and how it kind of came to the, I started to realize that maybe we'd done something pretty cool with the company, was when customers started building apps on top of us, uh, you just using our edge scripting language. So uh, multiple customers do various different forms of edge authentication. So that's everything from uh, token-based, uh, HMAC token-based auth for uh, video streaming to uh, doing paywalls for content publishers to um, edge, edge authentication for gift cards. This was a really cool one, was a customer did not have a PCI compliant network. Um, and so what they wanted to do, what we do. So what they did was they send a request into, uh, the, the, the client sends a request to Fastly. We send the request off to a third party that returns with PCI compliant data, just the last four digits of the credit card. And then we send that, that information back to the customer. So the customer does not need to have PCI compliance because they have no PII. We've handled all that for them. We've sent it off to the processor. We've got the PII, uh, the, 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 the data back strip from PI, and then we send it off, and then they can, they can do the, the, handle the gift cards. They built this without, us, without needing any help from us, which was kind of mind-blowing. This was really, really cool stuff. Um, so we also get stuff like, First Dibs built a complete A-B testing solution on the edge with us. One of the things they were worried about was, you know, when, the, when, you're, doing, um, when you're doing sort of A-B testing, you need sort of one URL to respond two different ways so that you can test at, like different variants of a page. And so Option wants to have two different URLs, just have it redirect depending on who you were. But then that's ugly. People know they're being A-B tested. Um, and uh, you also lose a whole bunch of SEO benefits. Um, the option B was to do all this server side, but then they lose all the ability to cache uh, at, on a CDN. They lose, it's much lower. If you've got customers, if their servers are on the East Coast and you've got customers in Australia or Japan, 
so much slower because you know coming from Australia, it's got to go under the sea to Hawaii, Hawaii to LA, LA all the way underneath the ocean, all the way to the East Coast, and then pop out somewhere, probably around by Ashburn, Virginia, and then pop up and, and go somewhere. That's slow. And then how can you really measure like how that's affecting your site if that bit of your site is much slower than, than anything else? So what they were able to do is put all the, uh, roll all the A-B testing logic into our edge code. And then they deploy that. They look at come in, they, put, they roll a random dice on the edge if a customer doesn't already have a, uh, a cookie, and then they send it off to, uh, they send them off to, they rewrite the URL to one of the, the two different variants, and then they log in real time, and they know in real time which one of those uh, variants is doing. And using various of other features, like our edge dictionary features, they can change the weighting of the dice and put people into more or less buckets, which is just really cool. That was another thing that kind of just blew my mind. There's a bunch of other stuff as well. Uh, because we give access to a whole bunch of information at the edge, people build stuff like uh, location and addition relationships. So they can look at the GOIP of the customer that's coming in, but also the language uh, accept header, which is one of those things that a lot of people forget about. This is one of my, my least favorite things is whenever I'm abroad, if I'm you know, sort of in Germany or something and I go to Google, Google starts returning stuff in, in German, which is just, I, my German is not very good. I can order two beers, and that's basically it. Um, and so, you know, especially if you go to somewhere like Japan or something, and suddenly all the results are coming up in Japanese, like, it's really, really frustrating, especially since my browser is sending the, the information that says, no, I, I speak English. Um, but what people, we've had customers do, we've do uh, we have customers, big publishers, who do multiple edition redirects. Um, so they look at stuff like, well, you're coming in from... Uh, this country, but like previously, so we're going to send you to the international edition, but then when you hit the override, we look at the, uh, the cookie. All this stuff can be done at the edge, so you still get all caching benefits. And in this case, you know, you go to, uh, you're looking at some site, some, I don't know, some coffee shop or something like that, like Starbucks or something, like, not really Starbucks, but some coffee shop that has multiple locations. If you go to locations.html, you can look up, oh, well, they're in, they're in London in the UK. We will show them all the sites in London. But you also need to look at the language except header because if I'm in Japan and I want to go and find all the, job, the coffee shops, like you can show all the locations for all the sites in Japan or in Tokyo, but I can show it to you in English because I know that you, that's what you speak. And all this logic can happen at the edge. So it happens really, really fast. It means you still get all the benefits of caching. It means you still get all the other benefits of a CDN. So all the WAF, all the load balancing, all the protection against surges, all that kind of stuff. You still get it without having to build out, sort of send everything back to the origin and make everything really slow. So this is the way we see stuff going in the future. The least, almost the least interesting stuff that have that CDNs do is caching stuff. Well, the really interesting stuff is this ability to move all your logic or a lot of your logic away from your origin nodes, which are slow and really expensive because they've got to be general purpose servers, and move it to the edge where it's fast and it's secure. And you can react really quickly and send people to the right location and have all kinds of recovery and failover and low balancing logic. And you don't have to do things like TLS termination because the CDN does it for you. If you can move a lot of your logic away from your origin servers, you don't lose any flexibility. You don't lose any uh, uh, visibility. You gain a huge amount of speed, and therefore, which makes you money. And um, you don't, uh, you, your customers are happier. Um, so anyway, that's the end. Uh, I'm kind of got about a minute for questions. So anybody? Thank you. <laughs> It's a completely open development environment. We give you a full edge scripting ability. Uh, and so a lot of this stuff, the customers built without us actually knowing about it. And then you know, sometimes they come and ask our customer support for help in the best way to do things. But often, like, our customers have built, um, have built stuff without us knowing. We also have a full sales engineering team. Um, and they build custom stuff for customers. As, uh, for, they build custom stuff for customers. Sorry, that was a very inelegant uh, uh, sentence. But uh, they build custom stuff for customers. And then often what we do is then, we look at the stuff that we build for customers. It's very personalized to them, but then we generalize it and then move it back into being a full feature for everybody. So. How, how unique is the language in which that edge scripting is? 
Sorry, just to repeat the thing, because I suddenly realized I didn't repeat yet, just for this sake. Uh, so how unique is the language? So uh, we're based on top of a piece of open source software called Varnish. Uh, Varnish is a reverse proxy. It's pretty well known. I think Varnish AB, which is the commercial company that, um, that so Varnish is open source, but there's also a commercial company that sells it. They're also one of the sponsors here. So the language is called VCL. Um, there are thousands of examples out in the, uh, out in the web. Uh, there's a great book, there's O'Reilly books, I think, uh, there's tutorials everywhere. So we, uh, we just implement that. So from, uh, from our customer's point of view, we just look like one giant globally distributed varnish cache. Um, and then behind the scenes, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening to kind of maintain that illusion. Uh, but it's, it's kind of like the power of the swan with, you know, it looks very serene on top and underneath we're frantically paddling. So uh, we have this edge coating language. It's, it's other people have, um, it's sort of available out there. So there's lots of people with expertise. There's Stack Overflow. There's, you know, people come to us with their existing varnish installs and are able to migrate to Fastly. So I did that. Yeah. 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 Oh, whatever. Um, so nothing, none, I don't think any of those actually relied on edge dictionaries. Some people have done, so our edge dictionaries are uh, essentially a kind of key value store. It's, uh, it was our attempt to move to separate, uh, sorry, the question was how much of that relies on uh, edge dictionaries. Our edge dictionaries are a key value store available at the edge. Uh, basically what we were trying to do is move, separate configuration and data so that you could update your data without having to necessarily release a new version of configuration because if you're trying to make changes then you don't necessarily want your development version change, uh, sort of deployed underneath you. Um, so uh, edge dictionaries, uh, a lot of these can help be helped by edge dictionaries but like, um, like none of those actually relied on it. The, I think the first dibs AB testing uses edge dictionaries to set up how many, what the size of the different buckets are, but that's not, it's not necessary. Um, you could probably do a lot of this in, in just plain VCL, but it just wouldn't be as globally distributed. Cool. Cool. I'm going to take the stunned silence for uh, awe and appreciation. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to be wandering around. There's a bunch of people with red t-shirts. We're, uh, we're pretty easy to spot. Uh, and if you've got any questions, come up and grab me afterwards, or I'm just simon at fasty.com, which is one of the benefits of being a co-founder. You get your first name at the, at the company. <laughs>